Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, my co-host Joe Stewart and I speak to inspiring teachers of yoga, movement, meditation, and more. I'm super excited about this episode. We are speaking with Fajal and Jaisal from the Yoga Is Dead podcast. Fajal and Jaisal have taken the yoga world by storm with their podcast, which asks some of the hard questions about yoga, raising issues of cultural appropriation, guru culture, and even the validity of some of what we might teach in a yoga class. They do this in a thoughtful and loving manner, but they definitely do not pull any punches. They provide an avenue for deep personal introspection on these matters. And I've seen many people, mostly white women, post online that after hearing the first episode, controversially titled White Women Killed Yoga, their initial reaction was to feel a little bit stung. But after sitting with it, they were able to fully integrate the message and see how they could make changes. And that's Fadyaya, right? That's part of yoga feeling the discomfort, questioning these stories that we tell ourselves and working with it. It's made me question my own role in all of this as well. I'm a person of colour, right? But my upbringing is one of a privileged Westerner. I'm part Māori and I feel in a way that the spiritual culture of my ancestors was kind of erased. It was effectively wiped over by Christianity. So for me, yoga is perhaps like a replacement, a substitute for that erased spirituality. Not that I'm keen on that word, spirituality. All that aside though, yoga is still something that comes from a completely different culture to mine. And I need to honor that the best way I know how. I'm still working through this. I've made mistakes and I'm sure I will continue to make mistakes. But the very least I can do, we can all do, is to learn as much as we can about the history and heritage of yoga, honour the culture and the people that brought us this wonderful gift to the world through our actions and not just words. All right, I'll get off my soapbox for now. It's time to announce the winners of the book Accessible Yoga by Jivana Heyman. Drumroll, please. The winners are Karen Buckland and Daniela Russo. Thank you so much to everyone who entered and a big, big thank you to Jivana Heyman and Shambhala Publications for providing us these wonderful books. I've actually pre-ordered myself a copy and if you haven't already, go and follow Jivana and Shambhala everywhere, Instagram, Facebook, you know the drill. I'll also leave links in our show notes at podcast.flowartist.com where you can buy the book online for delivery to Australia and it won't cost you an arm and a leg. That sounds like such an Aussie saying, doesn't it? Finally, before we start the conversation, I wanted to let you know about some workshops we have going on at our studio, Garden of Yoga, on Sunday the 24th of November with Tim Sutter. The first workshop is a two hour long energizing vinyasa style class. I'm really looking forward to that one. And the second is a little bit more yin inspired, a bit more chilled. Tim is a firefighter as well as being a yoga teacher and he brings a unique style and perspective to all of his classes. He's amazing. We spoke with him on the podcast a while back, so check that out. I'll leave a link in our show notes so you can book in or you can check on our website, gardenofyoga.com.au. All right, that is way more talking than I normally do. Let's get on to the conversation with Fajal and Jaisal. Fajal and Jaisal, thank you so, so much for speaking with us today. It's so great to get the chance to speak with you. I have to say that I really loved your podcast from the first moment. I'm also someone who has a name that some people find hard to pronounce. So I was wondering, do you still have people get your names wrong? All the time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was just thinking something happened to me yesterday when I was teaching. After class, a student asked me my name just to say hi. Yeah. Oh, it's nice to meet you too. My name is Thajal. She said, Thank you so much for class, Angel. (laughs) I mean, I guess at least that's a flattering one. (laughs) Yes, I get all the rhyming names. Rachel, Angel, Basil. I'm pretty sure Jaisal gets the same variations as me too. I do. And I get it from Indian people too. Like I get Sajal because that's a more common girl's name all the time. Sajal. I'm like, okay, sure. (laughs) 
I guess it's a way to sort out the people who have listened to your podcast and the people who haven't. Or do you even get it from people who listen to you and hear your names all the time on the air? I mean, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's for us when we talked about it. I think it was more about, you know, wanting to make the effort to get it right rather than making sure you get it right every time because people mess up. It's fine. Mm. But like, do you care enough? to want to put in the effort is kind of the question. That what I really got as well from that first episode is even though the name, like getting the pronunciation a little bit not perfect is one thing, just that fundamental sense of not taking the time to try to learn your name translated into people not remembering who you are as a person, even when you taught them in a yoga class or being in that kind of networking context, to not have the name means you just get lost in the background which is horrible yeah that connection was so critical for so many people to I think take it out of the context where oh they're just really sensitive and this happens to everybody it really put it into the context of their real impacts to doing this repeatedly over and over especially when it's your livelihood that matters and it's your community so both those both those situations get so impacted over the course of how many instances that occurs and then it just doesn't feel good and it repeatedly doesn't feel good but then it has all these other impacts so I'm glad that it resonated with a lot of people and also that a lot of people felt like this seems different than how I've always thought about it. Yeah I think really going into the other layers of what's actually happening there was really powerful and Another thing that you did with that conversation is just pointing out how minimizing it is to someone's experience just to be like, oh, this happens to me all the time. This isn't a big deal without thinking about how the context of how often it's happening and all of those other issues that are tied up with that can be really different depending on person to person. Yeah, absolutely. It it is so trivializing to say to somebody like, I'm not going to bother learning your name, therefore you don't matter. It's exactly that. You know, it's exactly what you're saying. Nice. Well, perhaps we could just rewind a little bit. I was wondering if each of you could tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and where you grew up, maybe starting with Jaisal. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, which is in the US. And it's about an hour from Boston, if people are familiar with that area. It was like a mostly white town with very little diversity. And my parents had immigrated from India. So they were the first in our family to immigrate over. My dad had come to America for college. He'd done his second undergraduate and a master's and he wanted to work in tech. So his dream was to come to America and work in tech. And he made that happen for himself. And so I grew up in that town, like my whole life, I stayed in that one town pretty much traveling, you know, to India occasionally to see family back there. And then I stayed in Massachusetts even for college. I went to Boston University. I graduated and then eventually I got a job in market research. So I worked in the marketing world for several years, working primarily on healthcare market research. And then I decided that it wasn't for me. And so I was going to quit my job and I knew I was going to quit my job to do something else. And in the meantime, I did a yoga teacher training. I was going back to India to see family. And so I decided during that time to do teacher training. And so I I went back and did it and ended up teaching full time. (laughs) So here we are today. Do you want to let us know about your background, Thaijul? It's so interesting. Jaisal and I have some similar background stuff and then we have different background stuff. So I don't want to repeat too much, but yeah, we're both Indian American and we're both first generation, meaning we were born in the United States and both Gujarati from India that state in India. And we actually found all that out much late, like when we first met in 2015. But now when we talk about it, about our past, it sounds so similar. (laughs) I also grew up in a small town in Michigan in the suburbs, just 20 miles from Detroit. Actually, not also, but I'm from the Midwest, a different region. And it wasn't like a very diverse area where I grew up. And my grade schools weren't very diverse. I remember there were more Indian kids in the schools I went to than black kids. And then so I kind of grew up in the framework of just having like an Indian community at home and friends at home. But then at school, things were a little different. So kind of just navigating the back and forth. And then I went to college in Michigan at Michigan State. And I studied both finance and math. And so from there, I worked in finance jobs for about nine years after school. And there was a point in those nine years that I quit my first job because I wasn't really learning, engaged. I wasn't excited. 
And I tried to look into other day jobs just to see and experience how I might enjoy other day jobs better. But I ended up running out of the money I saved. So that really real thing happened. And then I had to get another (laughs) job similar to what I had been doing prior. So I spent about four more years still working in finance. And near the end of that time, I decided to pursue a teacher training while I was still working. And I really enjoyed the time that I spent being a student and learning. And right after that, I had been told if you want to become a teacher, if you want to teach more, just do it. Just be out there teaching. So I started to offer classes and someone I knew invited me to offer classes in their physical therapy space after they would close down around five o'clock on the day on the weekdays. And and I got in there in the weekday evenings and on the weekends. And then I was still trying to practice yoga. I still have my day job. And so about a year, it wasn't that long. It was about a year later when I realized I can't do all of it. And I had to make a choice. And I realized that I really like my day job. That's fine. But I'm not as connected to the work as I'd like to be. And I think if I could pick what I want to do, and I really realized like, hey, I can, I think I can pick what I want to do, that I'm going to leave my day job to study more yoga, travel for a little bit, and then come back and see if I could teach full time. Wow, so interesting to hear how you were on like parallel paths in different cities with your growing up and your college and then that eventual decision to go from a really stable job into the world of teaching yoga full time. And I'm wondering as well for both of you, Was yoga a big part of your early upbringing? Like, was it something that your family did at home together or something that you discovered outside of the home? It wasn't really a big part of my upbringing in like a formal sense. I was first exposed to this idea of yoga, like because my parents would make me go to Hindu camp when I was young. So it wasn't like an all summer thing, but, you know, at least a week or two for the, every year, we'd go to this Hindu camp and they'd have a yoga teacher come like who was usually an old man dressed in robes and long hair wearing mala beads type thing. And he would come and you'd have to wake up early and he'd sit you down and say, here's some mala beads. Okay, count them and think of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so for, like in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And for a young kid, you're like, what? You know? <laughs> you're like, I'm trying to think of nothing. And all you can think is, how do you think of nothing? You know, the whole time. So um, <laughs> it was it was an interesting experience that first time around. And, you know, we did some asana, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like what it looks like now at all. It was just like a couple simple stretches It was mostly seated meditation. And I remember very distinctly that they taught us how to do pranayam and they had us put like one hand on our heart and one hand on our belly and just notice the movement of the body. And I thought that was interesting because I was confused. I was like, is this what I'm supposed to do? That type of thing. Like, is my body working right? So, (laughs) yeah. So, you know, when you're a kid, you have no clue. So that was my first exposure. And so, you know, know, my parents would like expose us to it here and there, but they weren't practicing it. They were, again, they were first generation immigrants or, or sorry, they were the immigrants coming from India and like they didn't have any help they were trying to raise two kids and provide and you know it wasn't something that they necessarily had time to do I did kind of get exposed to it again when I would go back to India because one of my aunts was into it and in the 90s laughing yoga was a big thing in India so she would go and do laughing yoga so that was kind of another experience I had with it and this isn't strictly yoga but my parents would do a budget every weekend with their friends It was just a social activity that they did. So they all got together at somebody's house every single weekend and they sang religious songs and at least for like the first half. And then, you know, you'd have dinner and then maybe they would sing like more film songs or something like that. And so, yeah, I did did have some exposure to it, but it didn't look like what it does now. But and it wasn't a regular part of my life. What a pity that that laughter yoga wasn't a thing when you were going to Hindu camp, because that just seems like it would be perfect for a bunch of kids. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure it would be. It's uh, the whole thing with laughing yoga is that it's like awkward, right? Like you start laughing forcibly and then you you break out into giggles because <laughs> it's so silly. So I'm sure a group of kids, it would t- that would exactly what would happen, right? You'd be like, what is this? It's so weird. And then just <laughs> I mean, sometimes kids just start laughing in the meditation anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is Thetel here. I didn't have a formal exposure either. I wasn't in classes when I was growing up, but... My kind of familiarity with yoga starts before I can remember it starting, if that makes sense, because Mm -hmm. it was part of the artwork in the home, it was part of the books in the home, and on Sundays we would go to the temple and pray, and on the walls in the prayer hall would be quotes of the Gita talking about karma yoga and jhana yoga and bhakti yoga, 
So that always felt like just a part of the fabric of my culture and of my identity. And I felt really spiritually collected, connected to it and through the philosophy, just from having the Gita in the house and always like referencing it. We would sing prayers at home on Sundays when we wouldn't go to temple. So that was always a spiritual aspect we did at home. And I remember uh, I have two older sisters and one of my older sisters would ask if I wanted to try yoga here and there, nothing consistent. And so I remember being exposed to yoga the first time with her because she invited me to take class with her. And when I finished college and I moved away from home, I realized now that I would seek out yoga classes in the cities that I lived and the places that I would visit as a way to like reconnect to some of those feelings and experiences I had from growing up, just to feel a little more connection to something that was familiar to me from my upbringing. And that experience never stuck. So I never was consistent at yoga studios, but I made that connection just over the last couple of days that that's essentially why I would dabble in going to take class. And I think because I realized that it never stuck, it never quite felt the way that I was maybe hoping for it to feel. That's why I decided to pursue a training where I could be on the student side of it instead of just receiving something from someone else, like wanting to really learn what it was first and then maybe seek out that experience that would stick. Oh, that's so interesting. So maybe if just in that time of trying all those different classes, you'd found that right studio that kind of had that authentic feeling that you'd grown up with, that would have been a completely different experience for you. Yeah, I think that. I think that might have been. But I'm, I mean, I have no issues with going in on the teaching aspect of it and or the teacher training route of it, because that really was my first experience with consistent asana practice the day I started my teacher training. I think that's true for a lot of people as well. It's like the teacher training is when you really have that deeper exploration and there's more time to talk about the other aspects of yoga beyond the physical and We've had quite a few guests who are teachers who just went to teacher training just to access those deeper layers, never planning to teach. I think that's pretty common, yeah. I hope hope this isn't too much of a personal question and it's fine if you don't want to answer, but I'm just wondering, how did your parents feel about you embarking on yoga teaching as a career when you've both come out of really stable jobs in like marketing and finance? Were they like proud and excited that you were doing something Indian or were they a bit concerned because they just wanted you to have that stable experience? Yeah, it's so, it's so smart work. that you asked ask that question, like that you were led there <laughs> <laughs> because uh, <laughs> my parents definitely were not excited about the career aspect of it, the giving away of like a very stable finance career and leaping into something they were like, what? You, how do you, what are you trying to do? Like grow ahead and practice. And my mom still says it to me. I know it's really sad. She still says it to me. You know, you can teach on the weekend. It can be oh. a hell, you know? <laughs> so she's not super supportive of it, but she's not actively, it's not an everyday phone call or text message. Please don't do it. But she doesn't really get it. Yeah. She just doesn't really get it. And I think bridging the gap of what is a podcast <laughs> It's also also really (laughs) challenging for her to grasp. And I also run another online community for South Asian yoga mindfulness teachers. And she also doesn't really understand what the goal of these things are. And I find I'm in a really weird cultural paradigm because she appreciates that I like yoga, but she definitely doesn't appreciate that I'm not doing a stable career, which is essentially why they moved to the States. They wanted what their impression of safety was for their kids. And so they're a little stuck in that mindset rather than rather than the mindset of if you're really happy, then I think you're safe. Yeah, my experience is a little bit different, but, you know, I haven't actually really thought about it until you asked the question. I will say that my parents are proud that I am doing yoga and like that I am doing something Indian, like you said. I think in the beginning when I quit my job, they were just like, you know, you need to do something. My mom, my mom kept saying, go back to school, go to grad school. So I think she wanted me to find a different career path for sure, or a more stable career path. I don't think she minded that I was doing yoga, but similarly to Thedal's mom, she did want me to have some things more stable financially in my life. I think honestly, and this is going to sound terrible, but it's just the truth. I think when I got married, they just stopped caring about it. 
they were like, oh yeah, you do yoga. Great. Because my husband makes a stable income. They were like, okay, great. We don't, you don't have to worry about that. And so I think from their point of view, they're like, oh, as long as he's doing fine, you're fine. And you know, it's an old school mentality for sure. And I don't necessarily agree with that mentality. And I have a different, <laughs> yeah, I have a different take on how I view my own life. Right. And so, but if they're, if they're fine with it, whatever. And it's funny that they just said she's trying to explain like what a podcast is to her mother, because the other day I had to try to explain what that is to my 94 year old grandfather who lives in India and is English is a second language. So that was fun. <laughs> he was like, come to India, come to India next month. And I was trying to tell him, I can't come because we have to finish this podcast. And he's like, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> I'm like, it's like a radio, but I'm your phone. I'm like, how do you explain that to someone? Oh my gosh. That's pretty much what I've tried to say. It's kind of like a radio show, but it's on the internet and everyone can listen. Yeah, I say that. I say yeah. That's radio show and it doesn't wow anybody so they're like okay <laughs> and <laughs> they're like so why can't you leave your life for this you know you're like okay I don't know what to tell you <laughs> the next question I usually get is how much are you getting paid oh, yeah. for this oh, yeah. <laughs> and that one has a disappointing answer <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> yep <laughs> So that actually leads me into another really interesting question that I have for you, because I love your take on this. And there's a really interesting distinction to be made between the commercialization of yoga and just fair working practices that provide teachers with a sustainable income. And sometimes there's like a real muddying of the water around money and yoga and where people maybe believe that it's not in the spirit of yoga to be paid fairly as a teacher. Um, would you like to speak to this? Yes, uh, Jaisal here and I'll go on this one. I feel like there's like a double-edged sword thing going on where on the one hand, you're not supposed to get paid for yoga, but on the other hand, you still have to live your life in a city like where people live and that's where they want it right and they want it close to them and they're not going to travel and they also wouldn't want to learn yoga from like a homeless person so it's like yeah. mm, what do you want mm -hmm. <laughs> right so I think there is this idea that yoga should be free for all and I do think that that there should be accessible yoga for everybody but what we one of the things we talk about in the episode is as individuals we should be able to make up our mind like when and how that fits into our life so that we're not beholden to this structure. Because in the olden days, in the South Asian region, there is a tradition of people taking care of those in the spiritual realm. So even in, whether it's like Buddhism and they have like a Sangha and they accept food and they can't say no to whatever food is given to them. Or if it's like a yogi who's wandering around with a bowl and begging for food, that's an acceptable part of society and people will give to them. And people will like build ashrams for these people to live in because they value the, the service that they're giving to society. But we've taken this practice and brought it into this capitalistic structure where people don't really value it in the same way. And especially with yoga, because it's not organized like an organized religion, right? So it's much harder to fundraise for this thing where like everybody's kind of doing it individually on this smaller scale versus Christianity, you have like big, large organizations behind this, like fundraising for the church. So from that sense, we have to like try to fit yoga into this new system that's never existed before. And so people have opened up businesses, they've opened up for profit businesses. And our whole thing is if you're going to do a for profit business, then the people working there need to get paid and should have a sense of security in terms of food, housing, transportation, belonging in society. And so all of those things need to apply. So I think there is a muddying, but we need to be more clear about like, well, we don't have a structure in place in this society. And the structure we've created is a capitalistic one. And the model that we've adopted for yoga is especially a capitalistic one. So we need to treat it as such until we come up with a different way of doing this. And as such, right, each individual as an employee or independent contractor should get paid fairly. And on the side, if they feel compelled to create an offering that is more accessible to others in the community that they can't reach, I think that's their own prerogative. And that's part of what we're saying, karma, dharma, and seva. Those things combined is an individualistic thing. Yeah, like that makes a lot of sense. And it's really interesting as well, because 
people want to practice in a beautiful studio in a handy to get to location. Yeah. And that doesn't come for free. There's no one donating beautiful studios for the benefit of yoga that everyone can come to for free. It's like you're saying, part of a system where everyone needs to make money to live. And that's just the reality of life today. Yeah. And I think we had quoted the sage who said something along the lines of you want yoga, but you want it in a five star hotel. You know, same thing applies with the studio. You want this beautiful studio and you want somebody who looks professional, has access to facilities, has access to nice, expensive clothing, even and education. And yeah, it's educated. And then the other question I've been asking, too, about this whole thing, like I keep on thinking it's not over <laughs> for me in my mind, but I keep on thinking, like, what do we say when we tell somebody that? you shouldn't get paid to teach yoga. Are we saying that only bad things in the world are worth Mm -hmm. money? So if money is like a value system we put on things, right? Are we saying that only bad things have a value and that good things should not have a value because those things should be free? That's a question I've been grappling with. Absolutely. So to change the topic slightly, your podcast has a really professional look and feel and you guys have merch. Do you see this as a form of activism that is just using powerful branding to spread your message? So I'll take this one. This is Stage Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. We really like that you think it's professional, by the way. <laughs> We're just too good. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Make, a, uh, make a statement here. But, so we really appreciate that you noticed that part of it. The podcast was just a, it was a labor of love to start with. And it was just from the two of us. And we had to make it reflect us. And so we use colors that pop. We chose a brown girl to be the Miss Yoga is Dead because we definitely don't feel we see enough people of color represented in yoga and especially not enough brown people or Desi people or South Asian people. We wanted her to be sassy that I don't take. I totally get that. Yeah, (laughs) I don't take no shit feel to her. Mm -hmm. Um, So we gave her that certain look on her face and we added a skull ring to add more attitude and then and play off the dead aspect. So that part was really fun for us. And also there was a sense of activism in there because we don't necessarily feel represented. And we realized that our stories were really deeply personal, but they might not be isolated. And if that's the case, we really wanted people to have something that felt representative to like that message. We've been having these conversations on the side. We want to put them to the forefront. So we wanted our image to be in the forefront as well. Pop. So we just tried to go really stylish, really bold. We wanted it to be a design that was evocative, like just the way you asked us about it. We really wanted people to talk about that design or feel something when they saw it. But in terms of like intentionally aiming for a strong design as a form of activism, I don't know that it was the priority. I think our priority was really what I just mentioned. And also we wanted to use design that was a little bit organized in a way. So if you notice, our podcast covers are all the same script, but the colors just interchange. So still that bright coloring because we wanted it to be attention grabbing. So I think it is powerful. And I do think that it draws people in, but I don't think intentionally we aim for that activism feel. And then for the people who supported us and supported that work, we wanted to have merchandise that reflected our message. Again, we wanted there to be more representation of within the imaging you see around yoga We wanted people who were interested in sharing that they enjoyed our work to be able to show something that they liked our work. The whole package, I feel like, was our attempt at being professional, but also authentic to who we were. And it was important to us because to have a kind of package because it created like these layers of defense around our message in a way. If people saw the name of the podcast and felt triggered or upset, then they might do some research. But the information was all well organized. They had somewhere to go to research what might have triggered them. I think that whole package is what we were trying to offer people to give them more education and knowledge around what we wanted to say. Yeah, I think that definitely shines through. And I think Maybe this is just an example of how just being really authentic and expressing who you are visually, people really get that and they really connect with it. And then there's the other side, like you mentioned, of people, it stirs something in them and they're like, whoa, why is this making me feel uncomfortable? Hopefully if they're thoughtful 
they're like, let me explore into this and do a bit more research and kind of see why this is triggering something in me. I guess this also comes to the name of the podcast, which I'm sure a lot of people think is really controversial and you've probably got lots of questions about. Was that name just something that like immediately came to your mind or was it something that you kind of workshopped together? Well, we workshopped (laughs) for a long time. (laughs) It took us at least several months to come up with this name. And we were going back and forth for months and months and months. And then when I think it came out of Thadel's mouth, I was like, yes. And the funny thing is like a week later, I was looking through my notes and I'd written something similar like weeks before. And I just, I guess I hadn't said it or seen it or so it was, it was the perfect name for both of us. It's definitely controversial. People get confused about it. They also think we're speaking literally. And so they don't really understand like as as millennials, this is kind of like millennial slang. And I hesitate to call ourselves millennials because (laughs) we're like older millennials, but (laughs) but we're kind of still, you know, in the middle with the slang. And so we know when you say something is dead, it's just kind of slang for like, it's over or it's passe or, you know, it's just not cool anymore. And so we get a lot of people who are like older than us who are like, but yoga is everywhere. It's not dead. <laughs> like, that's not what we're saying. No. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Hello, Ran popping in just to let you know about our Patreon page. Now, Patreon is just a way that you can help support the podcast for as little as $1 a month. Higher tiers get access to extra special content as well as a listing on our website and a shout out on the podcast. We use these funds to transcribe our favorite episodes so they're accessible to the hearing impaired or anyone who would prefer to read these interviews. You can read them on our website right now at podcast.flowartist.com. If you enjoy our conversations with amazing teachers, we would love your support. Just go to patreon.com slash flowartistpodcast. If you'd like to support us in other ways, it is easy. You can share our episodes on social media or you can rate, review or subscribe to us in your favourite podcast app. It really, really helps. That's more than enough from me. Let's get back to our conversation with Vajal and Jaisal. I'm just curious, how have your lives changed since you started the podcast? Honestly, they've just gotten busier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I think we can speak to this individually. Like I personally feel like my day-to-day life, besides I'm sitting at my computer a lot more, I'm doing a lot more work, but my day-to-day life outside of that hasn't really changed all that much. It changes when I interact with people that, you know, maybe have listened to the podcast or we're in a yoga specific space and people kind of know who we are. That's like interesting to me where some people like, oh, I've heard your work. It was so great. Or I resonated with that or things like that. But like on a day to day, I just feel like I'm still sitting in front of my computer. I'm still going out and teaching my privates. I'm still doing the things I would normally do. So when I say (laughs) it's just gotten busier, kind of is true. (laughs) It's just gotten busier. I definitely has gotten busier. And because I do teach group classes, I've had people come to take class because they've listened to the podcast. So that was quite a shock at first. And it was a way to really kind of marry like this nebulous internet world and then realize like I'm making personal connections with people from that, which is incredible. And we interact with so many more people now. I think that's just been wild for me to be in communication with so many more people than I've ever been. So it's been busy, but I feel like we've We're really just doing our best to stay afloat, like on top of all of it, because it's gotten so busy. Yeah, I feel like I'm just on my phone a lot more. And my husband's like, why are you always on your phone? You know, (laughs) so answer, I'm trying to answer all these messages. Say, Jewel, um, I'm not sure if this is something that you were doing before the podcast came out, but I think maybe I saw it on your Instagram, how you've been leading a few yoga and race issues workshops. I'm wondering if that's something you're like people are asking for you to come and do that at their studios now or if you've always been doing that and I've only just heard about it in Australia because now I follow you on social media when I wouldn't have done that before you had a podcast because I just wouldn't have known about you. Yeah oh that's so interesting. I had been leading those prior to the podcast so that's really where my interest was heading towards for me. Jason and I started talking about the podcast in January 2018. So it took us a while to get to June 2019, where we actually had an episode to release. But I have been leading those classes over a year now. So that's been really great. 
it's been really great because the yoga that I teach, the yoga that I offer has been getting closer and closer towards what's really important to me. And then I've been able to create the podcast with Jaisal, which is closer and closer towards what's important to me. So I feel like a lot of my work is in this beautiful synergy right now where I can continue to talk about things consistently throughout my day rather than in certain pockets and places where it's only welcome or only accepted. I guess as well, like when you put a podcast out, you know it's reaching people and people are listening, but it's just going out into the, into the ether of technology. But then when you're also concurrently running the concurrently <laughs> running the workshops, you get to make real personal connections with people and I imagine people get to ask you the questions that have come up for them once they've started thinking about these issues. Have you had any really like great questions from people or moments that come to mind or just, I know this work can be really hard, but has there been a really rewarding moment that has just made it all worthwhile or is it just that knowledge that like, yep, this is something that needs to be done and that's what keeps you going? There are so many, I will just say like battles, small battles that we've won along the way and stories that we've heard from people that have been really uplifting. And I have a couple experiences in the studio setting where I work or primarily spend most of my time where we've had these hard conversations around diversity within the teaching staff. We've had conversations around pay for community classes And they have been really challenging professional conversations for me. But because the team that I I really feel grateful to work with in the studio setting, and I'm just an employee there, I'm not a management, uh, a management member. But as an employee, we have a structure where those conversations have become something really positive. And I feel like being able to talk about that in my day job in the studio, also on the podcast. And that's what I meant about having the space to do my work everywhere I go has been really, really gratifying. So it's all very encouraging so far. In your guru episode, you named and shamed a few so-called gurus and their wrongdoings. And I know a few people I know commented that they were sort of worried about potential ramifications from doing that for you guys mainly. Did you receive any pushback from that episode in particular? Not in terms of the legality of it. And to be honest, we were striving to be very intentional about it from the get-go and from for all the episodes for that matter. We made things clear when it was like an allegation, when things are an accusation. And I think it's pretty obviously an opinion when we say something is an opinion. And everything that we talked about in the Guru's episode is documented. And there so there are have been rather things that weren't documented that we wanted to mention that were maybe like on a blog or in a rumor that we heard or through the grapevine. But we we omitted those things because we wanted to be sure that we kind of covered our basis from that point of view. So no, we didn't have any legal issues and we don't have any fear of legal issues because we just made sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've like posted, you know, if you if you've visited our website, we have pages and pages of like resources for each episode. So when it comes to like the gurus, we're still working on that section, but we've put so many links to all the things that you can read out there on each individual that we talked about. So it's not, we didn't come up with it on our own at all. And cases where like, I think there was like an anecdote that Dejal told where she like witnessed something. We didn't name names where it was like an anecdotal story. Somebody told us we also didn't name names. So we were conscientious about that as well. Fair enough. And in your vinyasa episode, you talk about the Mark Singleton book, Yoga Body, and how it's good to be skeptical of his conclusions and how they may even be a form of whitewashing and I think we agree with your view. Would you like to speak to this a little bit? Yeah. So we brought that book up and we actually noticed in his words that people are taking the conclusions from his book in a way that he explicitly stated not to do. He said he was investigating, Mm -hmm. he said he was researching, he said it was theories. And I think we actually quoted that. Jason, did we actually quote that in the episode, what Mark was saying about his work? Yes, we did. We had that whole section. Yeah, we had the whole section that he wrote. And he described how challenging it is to to try and trace back the origin. So we made sure to state that piece because I think what's happening is a problem where people are walking away saying, this is the origin story, or this is the point of view that makes the rule. So we have healthy skepticism about taking that book and then running with it for a couple of reasons. We pointed out that we know academia is pretty biased. 53% of professors are white males. 
So everything around the background and study and then studying from people who look and think like you can become a problem. Not saying that it is always, but it can create a false consensus. And then, you know, Mark Singleton works for a European institution with a Eurocentric viewpoint. For us, that creates a heightened level of awareness around the history of colonization by European countries of India and of the South Asian region. So we just want to keep that at the forefront as well. We know that Singleton and his colleagues, so again, that structure of who is in academia, are really benefiting from white supremacy culture. They're benefiting from being males who are white and who are given opportunity to recognize and unrecognize biases. And we haven't actually seen anything in their research or in their discussions that addresses that. So that's not necessarily something they're considering about where the work is coming from, how the work is being directed or pulled from. So that's a problem for us. And the team structure that we've noticed, there are a few South Asian people on his team, but none of them are in high positions or positions of good power within that structure. And something we talked a lot about in episode one is that we want to have authentically diverse viewpoints and opinions coming forward. Make sure that your representation is diverse and make sure that it's not just a structure where the people in power all look the same and they are the ones managing people who look differently or think differently or have different backgrounds to try and diversify truly within all levels of your organization. It's kind of mind-blowing. It's like if you're researching an aspect of South Asian culture, why aren't some of the most senior people on that research team from that culture? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and you know, it's mind-blowing, but it happens in every aspect of yoga teaching and yoga backgrounds. And not to name, but some of the bigger yoga educational institutions out there or where people will go to get their information is what you talked about. Like it's not diverse at all. The bodies of, not the bodies, but the groups of people that are the experts, not diverse at all. Yeah. And I mean, we have some more reasons to be skeptical. He wrote this book and he created this narrative. And and we know for a fact that most of the texts out there that are about yoga, the ancient texts haven't been translated yet. Mm. So, you know, that's like another reason to be skeptical. Another reason to be skeptical is that this is my understanding, and I'm willing to be wrong on this one. But from my understanding, they're looking primarily at yoga specific texts. So now they're not even looking at other cultural references and influences. So if you're coming in from an outside point of view, and you're only looking for this one thing, you're sort of missing the bigger picture, in my opinion. And then the other thing is that in yoga, we have a history of like passing things things down orally. And so they're looking at the written word because that's like where white supremacy culture says this is valid, only if it's written down. But from our perspectives and our like understanding, things have been passed down orally from student or teacher to student rather for generations and generations. And even so much of what we've learned from our families has been an oral passing of tradition. And so it's like, where do you account for the things that you don't know because things are haven't been written down? So it's like a lot of levels of skepticism. I'm not saying like his work should be invalidated, but we should be asking, what about the things we don't know? And where are you getting anecdotal evidence? And are you talking to like people who are 100 years old or close to it and getting their point of view just to validate or a different point of view on what you're researching, right? Yeah, definitely. And like what you're saying about all of those texts that haven't been translated, why aren't you drawing upon that knowledge of people who actually speak those languages of that text, or if it's Sanskrit, have studied those languages? Languages and access all of that other information about this field that you're trying to research. Yeah, it's like a lot we don't know, basically, right? At the end of all of this, there's so much unknown. And you've written a book with some conclusions that, or at least people take it very conclusively. And I know he wrote that in his foreword of his book or whatever to not take it so literally, but people have, like they just said, have, they've taken these conclusions and ran with them and created their own narratives. And I don't see his team coming out with any like contradictory statements saying like, actually, please don't use our work in this way. And even then, I guess he, he did go on to write The Roots of Yoga with James Mallinson. And they actually do catalog quite a few ancient practices from India that they've translated from some texts as well. But yeah, no, I totally get what you guys are are saying here. And I guess it's a slightly related question, but 
What do you think is the role of white people when it comes to speaking of colonization, cultural appropriation, or issues that may pertain to people of color? Because I sometimes see, I guess, white people taking the lead or even profiting from these issues, which does make me a little bit uneasy. Oh, thanks for mentioning that, Rand. I think let's take it in two parts, Jaisal. I think the role isn't that cut and dry, but it's also not super challenging. I guess, let me just break that down because I think there are many ways for white people to be involved, many, many ways. I continue to seek out teachers from like, different backgrounds than yours, different ethnic groups than yours, South Asian teachers specifically, develop genuine relationships with those teachers. And then if you have a platform where you can employ them and not only employ them, but partner with them through fair and equitable partnerships, nothing um, shady or really belittling their background or their education and saying, like, I don't have money, but I'd love for you to do the work, that kind of partnering. I think if you don't have the privilege to create opportunities or employment opportunities for others, seek out minority-owned businesses where you can invest your dollars for training and for practice. That's like a great way to show that you're in solidarity with other folks, that you are not only an ally, but you're an accomplice. You're using your dollars to help level up other people and their businesses as well. And then also like the one that might be the most overlooked or challenging aspect of this work, but I guess I can't really speak to that, is asking white folks to speak to other white folks about these issues. That's something that people can start immediately. Start learning how to have the conversations like more frequently and with more of your white peers and allies so that we can start normalizing all the work that people of color have consistently and historically been doing for everyone. Just normalize all the work that's before us by talking about it and finding ways to talk about it that's acceptable and accessible to basically everyone. Again, like I was mentioning, like so that you can talk about the things you're interested in all the time rather than only in certain spaces. And just to add to that too, I do think that there is a role for white people, even in leadership positions at times, but you, you have to be careful too. Like we do want white people to talk to their own communities, but at times it could end up being like the blind leading the blind if there isn't someone there helping direct the conversation, right? Or helping to recognize, oh, you're missing this important piece. Like, don't forget about this. Just because when you are white, you're so blind to it because you don't have to notice it, right? So partnering with a person of color, we think is like so, so important. Important. It's like the best practice, if you will, of being a person who does benefit from white privilege and wanting to do this sort of work. And we do end, think that it ends up being sometimes like performative allyship if you don't partner, because if you're only, like you said, profiting, right? If you're only doing something for your own benefit because it makes you look good or you get validation from it, then it is performative. And I we think that sometimes that performative nature isn't always conscious, right? Sometimes it's subconscious. Like sometimes it is conscious. People are just like, well, I want to look cool and I want to look like I'm a social justice warrior or whatever it is. But we'll give you an example of when it's subconscious. We had somebody reach out to us recently about participating in an event that they were putting together because they wanted to uplift our voices and they were charging for this event and they were not going to pay us or any of the speakers. But it was an event that they were charging money for. And so they didn't want to, they didn't want to do any profit sharing because to them. They were making the upfront investment. They were doing all the work behind the scenes to put it together. And so they were looking at it from that point of view. And their whole thing was like, well, well, we'll be getting you an audience. But I'm like, yeah, but there's a paywall between the audience and me. And effectively, I'm lending you my mm -hmm. audience. And I'm not getting paid. And I'm not getting any access to that audience. Like I'm not getting an email list or like access, you know, to the social media. I'm not like taking over your social media or anything like that. So at the end of the day, like that whole event was benefiting the white person organizing it much, much more disproportionately more than it would have benefited any of the individual speakers. And so I think we have to ask like, if you're a white person and you're trying to do allyship work, the essential question is who's benefiting the most from this action. And if the white person is still benefiting the most, regardless of whether they think they put in more work or whatever, then they're still upholding the status quo. They're still upholding this white supremacist like culture around us. And so if we want to dismantle racism, I think it is okay for white people to even profit off this work, but they have to be very, very careful that they're not the prime beneficiary of this work that other people are benefiting much, much more in a greater capacity than they are. And I think that's a really important and powerful message just to put out there for people to absorb that even if 
maybe that organiser was just a little bit misguided and their intention really was to put an important message about diversity out there. Your intention is not as important as your actions. So if they're getting paid from this event and nobody else is, this is the real world. They're profiting and that's something that they've got to look into and just keep in mind. So thank you so much for sharing that story. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's exactly like the, it's like, are you just maintaining this power structure inadvertently? Like you're the white person at the top and then everyone else is below you. And if you are even inadvertently perpetuating that power structure, then you're not dismantling racism. So your allyship is not allyship. I've seen memes on Instagram and Facebook and along the lines of if you become offended, you are not fully healed. And I think even one had a picture of Bruce Lee on it for some reason. I must be grumpy when I write these questions and I'm obviously not fully healed. But I'd like to hear your take on the sentiment. <laughs> First of all, that's memes are taken so out of context, don't you think? Mm. Like there's a meme out there and then you're supposed to feel better about life, the world everything around you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I think memes are a little pushy sometimes. And uh, I actually think that more people can feel bad after reading memes than better sometimes. Like, oops, they're made to feel that I had this human reaction about a thing. And now I feel totally bad about myself for having that human reaction rather than better. Becoming offended means I haven't quite subjugated my ability to be offended enough. So now I'm a bad person. I think that throws a lot of the meaning around yoga, a lot of the meaning about what we want to do with yoga is dead. It just like throws that around in a bad way. And we've also put out yoga is dead memes where we've intentionally wanted people to think twice after reading it. I don't know. We put up a post that said, if we're pissing you off, then you've got work to do. (laughs) Which is like the inverse of that meme. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know why we did it. (laughs) So we did it as a way to really like differentiate between are you going to explosively react to this and immediately get on your keyboard and feel really offended versus sitting with how you're feeling, taking that moment, that pause, registering what it is that you feel, and then trying to unpack why you might feel triggered after reading that. And whether or not it's just a defense mechanism to cover something else up. I can't remember if it was in your podcast or if it was in something that you posted on your social media, but it was something around if something has got you feeling defensive, like look into that. Mm -hmm. And that one really resonated with me. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're quoting the one we posted, but just different, your words are more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, and in the first episode, we made a very clear disclaimer about these type of explosive reactions that people might have to an episode called White Women Killed Yoga. And we asked people to consider why they might think that their opinions and their explosive reaction were more valid and more important than our voices being heard. Mm -hmm. It's really like a question to sit with and say, why don't we live in a way that allows for both of our responses or a variety of responses to coexist? And like in terms of the meme you mentioned, your healing doesn't need to be on my time. Mm -hmm. So please don't feel bad about that. Mm. And so I'm a white woman and I really enjoyed that episode. And I think one of the things that you do really masterfully is you weave personal stories and humour and productive suggestions for change into your message. So it's like you share your own story you share the issues, you share how we can all move forward and do better in the future when a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction is just to get really defensive when they're confronted with these uncomfortable truths. Do you feel like, do you consciously bring in a bit of levity when you are asking these tough questions and are sharing these messages that can be really uncomfortable for people to kind of lighten the tension? Absolutely. But I don't know if we do it for the reason you think. (laughs) Uh (laughs) We do it. We honestly do it more for ourselves than anything else because, okay, let's rewind. Like Dajel and I have zero background in creating media and like writing these types of narratives up until now. And so the, especially the first episode, like now we're sort of going back and 
be doing the episodes and we're being more intentional about it as well. But that first episode, like we were just laughing because this is hours and hours of work and we're bringing that levity in for us. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. Self-care yeah. is important for you. Like you're the ones doing yeah. the emotional labor. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so, yeah. Right. And I don't think we can have a conversation about race and like not bring humor in without us both ending up on a heap on the floor, just like <laughs> depressed and crying. <laughs> So, um, I think we needed that humor and to keep it light. And for us, you know, we're also taking in as much media as we are more than we are putting out there. And so we're also talking about like things we've seen, we've heard. And that just brings levity into it, I think, naturally, too, when you're referencing other things you've seen. And, you know, in terms of like you saying, oh, well, you bring positivity and you bring like more resources and you give action items. We are very discerning listeners. We are so impatient with our with anything. We're just New Yorkers, right? So we're super impatient. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, all right, all right, come on. Yes, yes. So like when we hear ourselves, it's painful. Like we have edited that every episode so carefully because we like want the pace to be quicker we don't want to be annoyed listening to it like if if we would be annoyed then we know other people would be annoyed and so what you said with like bringing in the positivity like that's another aspect like I don't want to hear an episode of someone just like complaining the whole time and then the end is like no conclusion (laughs) (laughs) but I I mean I want to hear like we expose the truths but we want to keep it actionable so that it's interesting and that it's something you can take outside of just the podcast. Like I wouldn't want to listen to a podcast that was just, oh, here are all the problems and I have no solutions to offer you. And so that's why we created this solution oriented outlook and this positive sort of light at the end of the tunnel outlook with all of our work and we've created like companion content to go along with that as well oh i think it's really powerful because it's like you shine a light on these issues and then you're like here's what you can do about it yeah and it challenges us to think about it too right like we didn't come with the solutions but we realized in creating this that we needed to come up with some solutions so we actually had to sit down and intentionally say like okay well what what do we want people to do What do we want to see? What could we do? What do we think we can do? And we tend to look at it as much as we can through three different lenses. We look at it through the lens of the teacher, the yoga teacher, because we are both yoga teachers. But we also sympathize with studio owners and business owners. And we also understand that the students have some agency in this situation as well. So it's like, can we look at every issue that we're exposing through these three lenses? And can what can we offer each group? Springing from that, do you see the Yoga is Dead project as having a conclusion or an end goal? That's a very good question. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we got this question. We're like, well, we don't really know. We can't say for sure that we started it with this end goal in sight. And even now that we're we're at a point in our first season that we're working to finish up two more episodes, we still aren't very clear on what that like end goal might look like. So what we can say is like throughout the process, so many beautiful things have come out of it. So many connections, conversations have come out of it. And we're interfacing with people on a whole nother level, personally, in a consulting manner. We're offering workshops now for folks. Uh, so we're going to continue just meeting people through social media, interviews like this, you know, across the pond, <laughs> and maybe take our workshops and like this whole show, like on the road. We don't know, but we're just on this journey and we're open to seeing where it'll take us. We're reaching near the end of our time together. So I was just wondering if you guys could distill everything that you've learned and everything that you teach and share on the podcast down to one core thing. What do you think that one thing would be? That's a big question. Uh-huh. <laughs> we'll save it for last. <laughs> they told you have any thoughts on this? Mine's a little flowery. I don't know if it's going to be Jaisal's, but I think it's going to be like never underestimate yourself. Investigate why you might think your story is not valid or why it's not the right time to do something. What is it that you're waiting for? And then once you figure that out, you might realize like now is the time to go ahead and do that big thing that you're scared of or weren't sure you were skilled enough to do or whatever it is like don't underestimate yourself because this journey has really solidified that for me and definitely with the help and support of Jaisal we've gotten it to a place where I had not seen us getting to and my wildest estimations and we're reaching people we're actually achieving like life goals of mine for community and engagement you know on different levels and I just never would have thought that would be possible through a podcast so that's mine mine is and again this also sounds cheesy but these conversations, the conversations are so important and need to be had 
so many times, like the same conversation over and over again. That is my key takeaway from this whole process because when Thajal and I started out, we started out thinking we were going to do a podcast. This whole original idea was not what we wanted to do. We wanted to do a podcast where two very similar people with similar backgrounds end up having different conclusions. And what ended up happening is through conversation and having the same conversation over and over and over again, I think we listened to each other more. We created more empathy. We started taking in information differently. And now we have much more of a similar outlook on every topic that we've talked about. And so we figured if that can happen for us, of course that can happen for other people. So if other people start taking these conversations and having them dozens of times the same conversation, hopefully we all reach a place of greater understanding. That's awesome. Thank you so much for those wonderful insights. And I felt like they were from the heart, but mm. not flowery, just like a lot of truth in there. And Joe and I are all about the cheesy anyway. So oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe I just can't see it because I'm just, that's who I am. <laughs> no, seriously, no, thank you so much for uh, creating this wonderful podcast. We've learned a lot from it and I know many, many other people have as well. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, we, we loved doing this one. All right, that was a great conversation. I love speaking with them both. I'd love to meet them in person. I hope I someday get the chance all right, for our next episode, we're speaking with former president of Yoga Australia, Josie Goosens. Josie was one of Joe's teachers back when she did her yoga teacher training at CAE, and I'm sure she's probably taught many hundreds, if not thousands, of yoga teachers in Australia. So that episode will really be something to look out for. All right, our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Joe and I would like to honour the elders of these wisdom traditions of yoga and mindfulness from India and beyond, as well as honouring the traditional custodians of the land where this podcast is recorded, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Thank you so, so much for listening. Joe and I really appreciate you spending your time with us. Aroha nui. Big, big love.